Okay, good morning everyone. So let me begin the lecture with an erratum for the last one. So in the last lecture we wrote this uh, dimension 8 Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian and I also wanted to write terms which involve the external current which I did not find in the literature so I made them up and I thought let's just take dimension 4 and square it then you get dimension 8. That is true but this dimension 4 operator is only gauge invariant up to a total derivative so if you square it it's no longer uh, invariant and one of you Eliudson immediately raised his hand during the lesson and said but is this gauge invariant and then in the exercise hour or in the question and answer we discussed this and it's not um, he also found a gauge invariant operator instead um, I also found one and it's the same and so I corrected my notes and put this operator so if you're interested you can look at the web page and see whether you get the same operator or, the way, or whether you find more now I'd foolishly promised that if one of you finds more operators that he gets a bottle of wine now uh, Eliuson found the operator and then said but I don't like wine I like chocolates so you see the students today are very demanding and I was a student <laughs> any type of drugs would do but uh, <laughs> so I, I went out and bought some chocolates <laughs> so. okay thank you now this has to remain a secret among us because I'm Swiss and chocolate is a matter of national pride so I'm in principle not allowed to buy German chocolate <laughs> but this is German chocolate so don't it looks good but uh, yes but uh, we'll, we'll see good <clears throat> so what we want to do today is we want to discuss renormalization in the effective theory we want to discuss the renormalization group and we want to discuss how to do perturbation theory in the, in the effective theory and this is called renormalization group improved perturbation theory and I want to take the simplest possible example where I can illustrate this and this is Fermi theory Um, this has been prominently featured in Monica's lecture of course as soon as you do flavor physics you'll deal with this Fermi theory she showed you some operators and an effective Lagrangian which had about 10 operators in order to keep this a bit simple I want to consider a particular PDK in which only two operators uh, contribute so that it's easier to manage so what we'll consider the, the following DK I want to take a B meson and it should decay into a positively charged D meson and a pi minus now it's maybe we want to find out what operators mediate this decay on the quark level so it's maybe worth to write down what quarks are in these mesons ironically the B bar meson doesn't have a B bar quark inside but a B quark so this consists of a B and the one I want to consider here the regular B then has a D bar then also extremely logical of course the D meson is the meson which has a charm quark inside um, this here is the pi on and it's a pi minus so it's uh, u bar d and this thing here is c d bar so this is sort of the quark content or sort of the quark flavor numbers of each of these mesons and now so if you look at the, what ha what's happening here on the quark level we start with a b quark and then we need to produce a charm quark, a U bar and a D so the quark level transition is that we have a B going into charm and then U bar 
d, and then this d bar quark, sort of the spectator quark of the B meson, will just fly through and then end up in the D meson. The reason for doing this process is you see that it has a lot of quark flavor changes in it. And so since all these quark flavors have to change, there are not many operators that you can write down. So this operator that we want, or the operators that we want, what they have to do is they have to annihilate a B quark in the initial state. And so uh, this you can do if you put, let's say, a B quark here. So this can annihilate. Then it has to produce a charm quark. So I can write an operator like this, B and then a C bar, and then some gamma matrix in between, and then the same here on the other side. So on the other side, I want to produce a U bar. Uh, this I can do with this field, and I want to produce a D. Um, I think that's the, that's the correct thing. So I have four quark operators. I can, they have to be Lorentz scalars, so I have to somehow contract the spinner indices with, with gamma matrices. I could also write down a second operator where I contract the other way, d bar gamma b, and then c bar gamma u some Dirac matrices. And the Dirac matrices which I have here, of course, they should be part of the, of the Dirac basis. So it's 1, gamma 5, uh, gamma mu, gamma mu, gamma 5, sigma mu nu. So those are possible choices for these gammas. I already anticipated that I have to use twice the same gamma because the operator is a Lorentz scalar, so I have to either use two vectors or two ones or two sigma mu nus. Um, and of course, the same for this gamma tilde in the other case. Now we can simplify things even a little bit more. So this has a lot of flavor change. And so this is mediated by the charge current. So this is really a W exchange, which will do this for us in the standard model. And so this is SU2. And SU2 only couples to left-handed fields. So I can put left, a left on all of these fields here. Left, 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 left. And so if I put left everywhere, then it doesn't matter whether I put a 1 or a gamma 5. If I put a gamma 5, I would get two minuses. So it's the same thing. So I can put uh, these things away. If you put a 1 between two left-handed spinners, you also get zeros. So that's also another possibility. The sigma also gives zero. So the only thing that I can put in between is a gamma mu. So also the the Dirac structure here is, is unique, so the, the current has to have a gamma mu, gamma mu structure with left-handed left -handed spinners. So it looks that I can write two operators, the one where I contract the Dirac indices in this way and put the gamma mu here, and then the other one where I do it the other way around and where, where I put the gamma mu here. But there's uh, this fierce relation. So there are these fields identities which allow you to take an operator of this form, switch two quark fields and then get an operator of this form. And it turns out that they're especially simple for this left-handed vector current. So this operator, the operator O, simply transforms into the, the operator O tilde. So it's actually good enough to include only this ordering of the quark fields. Uh, 
And so our operator then is what I have here. Now there's one more complication, which I didn't discuss yet. These quark fields carry color indices. And so I have to contract. There are four color indices, and I have to contract the color indices. And one way to do it is obviously just to contract the colors like this. So I have a color index i here, and a color index i here. And I have a color index j here, and a color index j here. Uh, these are color indices. But there's a second possibility. So this is O1. And in the second possibility, I contract the color, colors the other way around. So it's like taking the, op the operator O tilde and doing the standard contraction. So the second operator then is There's an I, a J, a J, and an I. So those are the two operators. Um, there are other ways of contracting the color indices. What you could also do is you could just put a color matrix in between. So you could put a a color generator TA between on the, on the left side and another color generator on the other side. And then sum over this. So that would be sort of the thing that you get from a gluon emission from these quarks. And now I should look at my notes. This is related to the other to the other two structures, so it's not a new structure uh, because there's a, a simple relation. So, delta I J. So there's a relation for the color generators, um, which relates this combination to the two we already have. And this is the same identity as the Fields identities that we have for the Dirac matrices. So this is sort of the color Fields identity, or one co color Fields identity. Because you see the ordering. These two sort of have one ordering of the color indices, and the other one has the colors flipped in the spheres. Good. So then we now have our effective Lagrangian for this. Um, after we've integrated out the weak interactions, what remains is just QCD plus QED, but we'll forget about QED because it gives smaller corrections. And then, so that is the, the dimension for Lagrangian. And then we have to, to, to add our two operators, which have four quark fields, so they're dimension six. And so we have a coefficient C1 um, times O1 plus another Wilson coefficient C2 times O2. And then there's some, well, then these coefficients have to be determined by matching, but it's convenient to take out the weak interaction part. So I'll introduce the coefficient G tilde, and this G tilde will be the weak interaction part so that these here are normal, is normalized to one at the tree level and the other one will be zero. So let me, let me write down what this G tilde is. So the G tilde has 
collects the GF that you will get and it collects the CKM matrix elements so we have a B to C transition so there's a factor VCB and then we have a UD transition so there's a VUD star here then for historic reasons there's a square root of 2 and because we wrote left-handed instead of vector minus axial there's another factor of 4 here now, if you take out this normalization factor, then at the uh, tree level, the C1 is equal to 1. I'll just draw the diagram in a second. And you would find that the C2 is equal to 0 at the tree level. But because we want to discuss renormalization and uh, renormalization group improved perturbation theory, We'll now go to one loops. And so I want to write down the one loop diagrams contributing to this quark level process, both in the standard model and also in the low energy effective theory. So In the standard model, which will, is the full theory in our case, we have the transition B goes to C, and U to D. And there's a W exchange in the middle. And now we want to do corrections. So if you do this, and if you compute diagrams in the low energy theory, in the low energy theory, I'll indicate the diagrams like this, where I put the two crosses for the two contractions of the, of the Dirac fields. And so this is the Feynman diagram for the four core operator. So if you would do the tree level matching like this, you integrate out this. Uh, you compute this, then you would read off that this C1 contains this GF. This GF is just the two weak couplings here squared divided by MW squared, which you get by expanding the propagator. And so th we discussed this briefly in the first lecture. So now we do loop corrections. So one loop correction is I can do sort of a vertex correction up here or down here. Um, I can do a loop correction like this on the left and of course also on the right or I can do a correction like this and then you get sort of the ana analogous diagrams in the Fermi theory So vertex correction and as I said so I've, I've drawn the vertex up here but of course there's another diagram where it's down here so it's this diagram plus mirrored diagrams where I just flip And it's important to keep in mind that these are, these are really two separate theories. So one is the standard model with its loop diagram. This is our effective theory with its loop diagrams. In principle, these diagrams don't have to be immediately relate, related. But of course, you kind of see one to one where the different diagrams go. And you see that sort of if you contract this W line to a point, then you get this theory in the, this diagram in the effective field theory, uh, the same here.
And so now we should do one loop matching again. And we discuss the procedure. Um, we can compute, basically, we have to compute the same quantity in the full theory and in the effective theory. Mm -hmm. And of course, the simplest quantities to compute here are just exactly this, this, this amplitude for this quark transition. And then there's some external kinematics. Um, and I can. I have to use the same kinematics, but I can again simplify things by making these kinematics as simple as possible. In the Euler-Heisenberg, what we did is we took forward scattering to make things simple. Here I'll do the matching on the level of Green's function. So, so what is the simplest possibility to do it? So the simplest possibility is to set all the small scales in the problem to zero. Because these coefficients that we want in the matching, these C1 and C2, they will not depend on momenta or quark masses or things like this. So the simplest way to evaluate these diagrams for the matching is to set all momenta and all quark masses to zero. If you do this, what will happen to the effective field theory diagrams? So now I'm deciding to use some kinematics which are convenient. And I said, well, the most convenient is let's simply set all the momenta to zero. And I can also, in the QCD Lagrangian, there are quark masses, but these coefficients will not depend on it. So I also set these to zero. So what happens here? Yes? Yes. There will be infrared divergences, but sort of more specifically, what will you get when you compute the diagrams? So what happens is, so, so the loop integrals they will look like this. So there's an integral d d k. Then all of these integrals have uh, two fermion propagators. So we don't have any quark masses. We don't have any external momenta. So the, the propagator will just be 1 over k slash. Then there are some gammas, which have nothing to do with the previous, let's say, gamma 1. Then there's another k slash. Then there's some gamma 2. And then there's um, a gluon propagator going across. A gluon propagator gives 1 over k squared. So that's the form of the diagrams. And you see there is absolutely no scale in this integral, pre integral precisely because we said all the scales equal to 0. So these are all equal to 0, which is, again, this strange feature of dimensional regularization. Um, what it basically means is if you look at this diagram, it's 1 over k to the fourth. So if you go to with k to very large values, it's logarithmically divergent. But it's also logarithmically divergent in the infrared if you go with k to very small values. So you get sort of a 1 over epsilon ultraviolet minus a 1 over epsilon infrared. Now, there's not really two epsilons, so what you really get is just 0. But if you want, you can put something in between, and you see that it's two of these things which cancel. Now, if you go to the full theory, 
Um, if you would look at these diagrams, you would find that this first diagram will have the same problem as the effective field theory diagrams. I mean, this is really just the same. So this also becomes zero. It will also have an infrared divergence. And these infrared divergences between these two diagrams actually cancel out. So in the matching, these infrared pieces, like the, like the quark masses or like the momenta, will cancel out. Now, when you do this the first time, then you might feel uh, guilty about having things which have both UV and infrared divergences, which are regularized with the same parameter. But in practice, this is not the problem. So all the professionals will do this. And if you would do this at three loops, it would be really hard not to do this. Because if you have all these quark masses and momenta, the, the diagrams will be impossible. While if you set them to zero, they might be barely doable. But however, we will not do this simple possibility. So I don't want to do this because I don't want to have these infrared divergences. I would like to sort of use a different regularization for the infrared as for the UV so that we can really read off all the different divergences separately. So I will set the quark masses to zero, but I will not set the momenta to zero. But I will set them all equal and will set them all slightly off shell. So we will not use this. We set all of them equal, and then p squared is set not equal to 0. So there's some theorem that guarantees you that if you stay off shell, that you will not have these infrared divergences. And so now we should do the computation. Now, these are, in terms of loop integrals, these are not really complicated. So the computation is certainly doable. On the other hand, it would take up my entire lecture. And so I will give you just the results and we'll discuss the structure of the result. In some sense, maybe the most difficult part about these diagrams is that you should also, if you regularize dimensionally, we should also do the Dirac algebra in d dimensions. And at the beginning of my lecture, we wrote down all the possible operators, and I only wrote operators in four dimensions. So there is a problem. If you go to d dimensions, for example, it's not clear how this gamma 5 is even defined. So there are methods to deal with this. There's something called the Tuft-Weltmann scheme. There's another scheme called the Larin scheme. And yet another is called naive dimensional regularization, where you kind of ignore the problem and use an anti-commuting gamma 5 also in d dimensions. So there are schemes to solve this problem. But what will definitely happen, if, especially if you go to higher orders, not yet at ours, is that you will need additional operators which are not there in four dimensions. So these additional operators are called evanescent operators. And you will need to, if you go to two loops here, you will have to introduce them and, and deal with them. But again, so we'll not discuss this. This problem has solutions. Um, so let me write the results. So I'll give the diagrams names. Then we can also, so this is A, this is B, and this is C, and the same name for the other one. Then we can discuss which part comes from what. And let me try to write down the result. So first, the full theory result. Of course, it contains this G tilde. And then um, I'll write the result up to one loop. So there is the one, which is the tree level piece. And then it's plus 2CF alpha S over 4 pi. 
1 over epsilon plus log u squared over p squared. So I will write the three-level result in this very symbolic form where I just write three-level matrix element of the operator. This is just a trivial thing that you write the four spinners and the gamma mu in between. And so this is this, and then there's this, this uh, one loop coefficient here. Um, then there's alpha s over 4 pi log mw squared over p squared. 3 over number of colors. So that is the full theory result. Um, this CF is just number of colors squared minus 1 over 2 number of colors. And the alpha s here is the strong coupling constant squared over 4 pi. And in terms of diagrams, this first line here, this is diagram A. This second line here is what you get if you compute diagrams B plus Good, so that's the full theory thing. Now, fortunately, there's no longer a red line, so I can write, is it true that you can see the effective theory result if I write it below? So there's the same G hat. So there's a little bit of writing work involved. You see there are some divergences both in the full theory result and the, in the effective theory result. So what I've written here, these two lines, this is if you start with the operator O1 and then start computing loop diagrams. But of course, you can also start with the operator O2. Um, and then you will also get an expression. And the nice thing is that this contribution you just get by taking this other line and replacing 1 and 2 everywhere, at least in the indices. So there's another contribution. If you start with C2, blah, 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 then you end up with O2 plus this thing 3 over NC with O2 minus 3 O1. So this is the result. Um, now we can discuss it a little bit. So we see that there is a divergence. Um, well, there are there's a divergence in the full theory, but there are many divergences in the effective theory. Also in the effective theory, um, this part here 
is again diagram A, and the lower piece here is again diagrams B plus C. And of course, not surprisingly, this diagram A contribution is completely the same in the full and the effective theory. So what's the divergence that you that we have here, or how, we, how can we renormalize the divergence away in the full theory? So I should even, I haven't even exactly said what I do here, so I work with amputated Green's function. So these results here, amputated, oh, slightly off-shell Green's function. Yes, so what cures this divergence here? Maybe the first thing that always comes to mind is coupling renormalization, but that's not a good idea because there is no strong coupling here up front. And of course, uh, renormalizing the weak coupling to get rid of this also doesn't make any sense. So it's not coupling renormalization. Ah, the question is what, what kind of divergence is this? Um, we, if we would not have used an off-shellness, there would be these infrared divergences discussed yesterday. Um, but since we're off-shell, there are no infrared divergences. So this, there, there is, if you want, soft emissions, but they give rise to this log p squared. So if p squared goes to zero, there is a divergence here coming out. But it's regularized with this p squared. So this one over epsilon here is really uh, an ultraviolet divergence. Maybe slightly an unfair question because I haven't, I've not exactly specified. I've said amputated Green's function, but I'm really taking the bare fields in the Lagrangian and I'm computing these Green's functions. And then you have to do wave function renormalization in order to get finite Green's functions. So that is this wave function renormalization constant. And we have four external quark fields. Each quark field gets a square root of this wave function renormalization. So it's two of these. And so here the divergence is plus two over epsilon. And so you get minus two times one over epsilon. So this removes this divergence here. So this goes away here. Now in the effective field theory, the Lagrangian is also the QCD Lagrangian, the lowest order one. So you have to also do wave function renormalization. And it's, of course, exactly the same uh, as in the full theory. And it cures this divergence here. Sir, can I, can I ask a question? Yes. I, I don't really see, just looking at the diagram of the full theory, I mean, this looks completely like a, a vertex renormalization and not like a, a propagator Correction, so yeah, so the diagram that has this problem is this vertex correction. Right. And uh, this vertex correction has an ultraviolet divergence, which is cured by this wave function renormalization. Right. I'm not saying that this diagram 
plays a particularly interesting role in this matching because you see it will exactly cancel out sort of between the full and effective theory. But of course it's there, and so I'm writing it down even though it's not the most interesting contribution, but it is a contribution. And the full theory is finite after you do this, but you see there are all these divergences still floating around in the effective theory. So there's still a 1 over epsilon here, uh, even with different coefficients multiplying these O1s and O2s. So in the full theory, you're kind of done at the one-loop level renormalizing, and in, in the effective field theory, you're not. And so what do you do in the effective field theory? Kind of the usual thing, we have these Wilson coefficients and they're like coupling constants. So we have to do kind of a coupling constant renormalization for the C1 and also for the C2, which is hidden here in this 1 to 2. So if we have this Lagrangian C, the, the dimension 6 Lagrangian, it has these two operators, Ci bare, and then I have these four quark operators, operator I, which depend on the bare fields. I don't want to write down all the, all the structures, and I'm not writing the summation over i, but it runs from 1 to 2. And so, and there's the g hat, which I forgot to, to write. And the way I introduced it, there's a, it's a minus g hat in the minus g. Good, so we, one thing we have to do is to renormalize the field. This we did, but we also have to renormalize these couplings. And now here is, a, is an important thing, which you, in principle, this renormalization is exactly the same as in the standard quantum field theory course. But here you have two operators, O1 and O2. And these two operators have exactly the same quantum numbers. And if you do renormalization in such a system, it's not good enough to simply replace C1 by C1 times a C factor and C2 times a, its own C factor. But these operators mix under renormalization. So you have to introduce a matrix of renormalization constants to take care of the divergences. So you can write this as G hat, then Ci, and now I can put a renormalized constant. Then there's a matrix Cij, which is supposed to pick up all the divergences. And then there's the operators Oj. And in these operators, I will now work with the renormalized fields, which I get after multiplying the bare quark fields with the wave function renormalization constant. So there's a Cq squared. And then, of course, when you expand this C factor, like any C factor, it starts as a unit matrix. And then there are corrections of order G squared or alpha S over 4 pi. And now we should read off what these corrections are. Let me write down what the CIJ1 is, and then we'll verify that if we plug it in, that it takes care of these divergences. So it has a 1 over epsilon divergence, obviously, because it has to take care of this 1 over epsilon. And then there's a 3 over number of colors, a 3, 3 minus 3 over number of colors. It has this nicely symmetric structure uh, because our diagram is so nicely symmetric, but it, in general it doesn't have to be symmetric. That's just an accident of the choice of bases that we, that we did. 
Um, so now we can plug in. So what you would now do is you would also expand the Wilson coefficient. So these are the C's, and then you would expand the Wilson coefficient CI as the renormalized one as CI three level plus alpha S over four pi CI one. And then if you go to order alpha s, you get two contributions. One contribution comes from the three-level Wilson coefficient times this one-loop correction we computed here. And then there's a second correction, which is the one-loop correction to the C factor times three-level matrix elements. And you see that the divergence structure here is if you start with one you have this 3 over nc times 01, so this 1, 1 component is therefore minus 3 over nc, so that it kills this divergence. And the other thing is plus 3, so that it kills the minus 3 divergence here. And so this matrix indeed, once you plug it in and expand, will cure these divergences. This renormalization works independent actually of the actual values of this CI0 and CI1. So in the standard model one of them is 0 at 3 level and only enters at the 1 loop, the C2. Um, but you could start with a different full theory where the, the, the values would be different but the renormalization would still work. So now we have renormalized. I don't know. If this renormalization a different color, and so this second renormalization takes care of this divergence, and we have finite results also in the effective theory, and now we can read off the one loop coefficients uh, from the difference between the full and effective theory. And let me think what I want to delete. Maybe I'll delete these things here so that we can keep the diagrams. So this is now matching, so I say the difference between these two things should be zero, and this gives, uh, gives the Wilson coefficients. <coughs> so we had the one here, and then we get the one loop correction for C1. So it's 1 plus 3 over n alpha s over 4 pi. Log mw squared over mu squared. Zero at three level minus three alpha s over 4 pi log m w squared over mu squared. So this is what you would get if you subtract these diagrams. I, out of laziness, I didn't write the full result actually here. I only wrote terms which have logs or divergences. So there are additional alpha times constant terms. And if you also compute these, you would get mon minus 1, 11 over 6. Now these constant terms actually depend on what you do with the gamma 5. So this depends on your gamma 5 scheme. And this is true in the NDR scheme. 
which is called, this is called naive dimensional regularization, which shows that it's maybe a dangerous scheme. But if you know what you do, you can maybe use it. And people, actually, there are papers which did the two-loop computation in three different schemes, and then you get different results for the Wilson coefficients, different results for the matrix elements, but the same for physical quantities. So let me just write, this is from alpha s times constant, which were emitted, omitted in the other result here. Sorry, this is C1 and C2. Yes, exactly. So this is C2. One feature you see here is that these C1s and C2s, they depend on the scale mu. They also depend logarithmically on the W mass. And this was somehow something which was advertised. So I said, well, we have these dimensions of the operator. These O1 and 2 are dimension 6 operators. And um, they also have an anomalous dimension. And the Wilson coefficients still have logarithmic dependence on uh, this W mass, which you explicitly see here. Yes? Uh, I'm just a bit confused by this matching, because you're, you're doing this uh, gamma fold minus gamma effective equals zero, but that needs only, only needs to be true in the infrared, right? But it doesn't seem like you're specifying um, at what scale they need to match. So here it just seems like you're saying the full theory and the effective theory have to agree both in the UV and the in the infrared, and that I don't understand that. Yeah, so the, the statement is simply the full and effective theory have to agree once you expand the full theory in powers of P squared over MW squared. Right. So this diagram, also that's the other it. slight uh, cheat. Of course, if you compute this box with the W, it's a more complicated function, but we're interested in the low energy limit. So when you compute, you can expand in p squared over mw so you've squared. Done that. And this is already done, so that's oh, maybe okay. a good point. So okay. this is plus plus terms of order p squared over mw squared. And this is our expansion parameter lambda squared. If you would include dimension eight operators. So that would be a four fermion operator, for example, with two derivatives. You could reproduce these terms as well. But they're simply beyond the accuracy of our computation. And the other thing we should worry about, so I have did one loop here, but again, you could ask, well, how about one loop without, with these operators C1 and C2? Now, they don't really fit together in terms of quantum numbers, but also the it's a dimension 6 operator, so if you take two of them, you get a dimension 12. And dimension 12 will be suppressed by 1 over... No, it's not dimension... This, this I take back. If this operator is dimension 6, so it has a 1 over mw squared. Mm -hmm. If you insert it twice, you get two powers of 1 over mw squared. So this is, again, beyond what we do. It would only be dimension 8. Sorry? Press C2. So, but so many this provisions, right? C2. C2. You know, there's like, here are these provisions, right? C2. Yes. This you get by solving this equation. By, by, by imposing that up to order alpha s. And up to terms which are down by p squared over mw squared, they have to exactly reproduce the standard model result, yes. And yes, ah, now I, so this is a, this is the sneaky thing that I wrote the contribution involving C1, but there's a second line here which I said. So take this, this expression is twice as long. Take this and add with the same expression, but exchange all the indices one and two. And it's just an accident that this is symmetric. Well, there's no real accidents, but there's no... If we had chosen the singlet octet, so TA times TA, it would not be symmetric, yes? Yes?
Yeah, so there's, an import, there's, a, there's a very important feature. Let me discuss the feature and then you can ask the question again. So this, these coefficients now depend on mu after renormalization. And you see that they contain a log of mw squared over mu squared. So if you want to compute the B decay and you go to a very low scale with this mu, this log gets large. And so then the perturbative convergence is not so great. On the other hand, if you choose mu equal mw, then the log is just zero. And then only these constant pieces, 11 over 6, remain. So the reason that people like to choose mu equals mw when they do the matching is then the matching correction is small. Yes. Yes. Well, this has no this has no mu. This has no mu here. If you think about this in terms of some cutoff or something, then it seems strange that that we take this effective theory all the way to the cutoff. So if you think that this mu is like the Wilson lambda, then it's kind of weird. Then you say, "What? You go all the way up?" But this is not the the, the Wilson lambda, so we're not using a cutoff here. This is just a statement we renormalize. After renormalization, we have uh, dependence on some arbitrary scale. And the physics obviously will have to be independent of this scale, and that leads to this renormalization group equations. But there's nothing wrong. In, in fact, it's exactly what you want. The best choice for this scale in terms of convergence is to choose m, mu equals mw, because it kills all these logs. Yes? Well, it comes in, if you introduce it, it depends how you exactly introduce it, but you introduce it in this renormalization process. If you take the bare ones, they will not depend on it. Yeah, I mean, for me, I always thought that you introduce the new and the loop integrals that you compute in dimensional regularization such that the coupling is dimensionless. Yeah, so the mu gets introduced to make the coupling dimensionless. So you say, I want to have my renormalized coupling a dimensionless quantity. And so then you write it as mu to the 2 epsilon. We discussed very early on what happens in the gauge case, and we said if the dimension is not 4, the gauge coupling has a dimension. So we introduce this mu to the 2 epsilon. That's how it comes into the game. But, in but the, the appearance of a scale is a characteristic of any factorization, right? Yes, I mean, like the, the, the thing is, in, if you would do sort of a cutoff scheme or so, and you would also renormalize, you could also get this renormalization scheme, which basically tells you a little bit how do you, what do you put in the Wilson coefficient, and what do you put in the matrix element. Mm -hmm. You had Wilson coefficient times matrix element, you re the matrix elements were divergent, and now you took these divergences and you moved it out. And this is arbitrary to some extent, and this arbitrariness has to do with this mu here. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I, uh, perhaps this is just a misconception, but I, I recall that when you, when you do this matching to get your one, like these results of C1 and C2, you don't actually have to calculate the, the typical box and, and, and hang on integrals in the full theory. Right? So are, we, are you actually using the, the result of the full theory? To get yeah, for the matching, you have to compute the full theory integrals. But can't you get the, uh, the wave function normalization from? Ah, oh, we could we could have uh, we could have. I mean, this wave function piece anyhow drops. You see, this one to one drops out sort of in this matching. So this is in some sense uninteresting. All the interesting stuff has to do with these diagrams B and C, because you see that this diagram here basically gets reproduced exactly up to the expansion of the propagator. While here something interesting happens. Here, sort of this expansion of the propagator is not exactly commuting with the loop integ integration. And in order to make up for this, we have to to add these Wilson coefficients and uh, adjust them. If we had done this on-shell matching, so if I had set the p to zero, one doesn't quite see it here, but all these go like p squared to the power epsilon, so they're all, there's the scale of integrals, all of this would vanish. Here, instead of an mw squared over p squared, you would get an mw squared over mu squared and some infrared divergences. But if you do the matching, things drop out and you would find exactly the same. So you really can do it. You can set this p squared equal to zero. 
compute only the full theory diagram in this simple kinematic situation and subtract and get this. I mean, it's that's one important feature of this matching. So there's this low energy scale p squared. And this should drop out because these Wilson coefficients cannot depend on this p squared. Otherwise, I mean, this becomes a derivative. Then it would be some horribly non-local theory or something, some strange thing. So this p squared dependence has to drop out. And if you do the computation, you also find that it does drop out. Good. Um, now, we were discussing this mu dependence. If you would go to two loop, you would actually get an alpha squared times log squared. That's three loop and alpha cubed, log cubed. And so you definitely want to choose this mu on the high side in the matching in order that perturbation theory works well. On the other hand, later on, you will compute matrix elements. We want to compute this BDK. This you want to compute at the low value of the scale. Now, we compute this matrix element, these off-shell Green's functions, which are not really physical, but they have similar properties. So the low-scale matrix elements will have logs of mu squared over p squared. So these only converge nicely if you choose the mu squared low. So for the matching, you want to be high. For the computation of these matrix elements, you want to be low. Now, if you do fixed-order perturbation theory, there's only one scale mu. and so. Either choice is bad. If you choose it high, the matching will be well behaved, but the matrix elements will be horrible. Or if you do the opposite, it's the opposite. And so this problem can, solved, can be solved using these renormalization group equations, which we want to discuss next. So, um, so we have the scale dependence. And so this scale dependence fulfills a set of equations equations which we will now solve. And we can, can uh, derive the scale dependence, for example, by computing dd log mu of the bear coefficients. Now, the bear coefficients do not depend on mu. So if I compute here the ci bear dd log mu, I simply get 0. But we wrote the bare coefficients as renormalized coefficients times this uh, C factor. And now we see that the scale dependence of the Cs will be real. It's a bit unfortunate that everything is called C, and presumably with my accent, everything sounds the same. So the C coefficients and the scale dependence of the C coefficients has to cancel against the scale dependence of the set factor. So by the product rule, you get d d log mu of the C times C i j plus C J J I plus C J D D log mu C J I has to be zero. And so you can write this in a slightly nicer form. So if you multiply from the right with the inverse here, this zero equation with the inverse of this C, then you kill the thing here, and then you get directly d d log mu of the coefficient C i. And this is then some matrix C i j. And the matrix is this derivative of 
So this matrix is this derivative of the C factor multiplied by the inverse of the C factor. And then I think there's a, there's a minus sign because I want to take this to the right hand side. So gamma is equals minus d d log mu of C of this matrix here multiplied by the inverse of the C. And that's a simple, a simple equation here which we can then solve to start with the coefficients at the high scale, then we'll solve this mu, this, this Archie equation and evolve down. So this is the Archie equation for these Wilson coefficients. And this here is the anomalous dimension. And we have, well, computed is a big word, but at least I've written the C factor on the blackboard. So we have the C factor, and so we'll be able to compute this matrix here by taking this derivative. Um, there's some nice relations. So one nice thing about DIMREG is that this matrix C is just a unit matrix plus a sum of poles. So So all we do is subtracting these pole terms and so then this entire C matrix is the sum of the poles and because of this you get a very nice relation for the anomalous dimension. So it's just given by 2 alpha s and then the first derivative of this C1, the pole term, with respect to alpha s. And if you do it in our case, um, you get this alpha s over 4 pi. I mean, we had this C matrix which had an alpha s, so we take the derivative, which just means drop the alpha s and multiply it back with a factor 2. So this C factor is just simply twice the 1 over epsilon poles. So this C1 is 1 over epsilon poles of our C matrix. So for us, this is, if I remember, it was a 6 minus 6 over n. So that's in our, our case, but this first relation here, this is always valid. And uh, this is, I think, sometimes called the magic relation because it's, uh, in principle, you should do this complicated thing here and take derivatives with respect to log mu. But then in practice, all you need is basically read off the one over epsilon coefficient in this uh, anomalous dimension to get it. And this doesn't take a lot of effort to derive and I wanted to do it, but we're running a bit short of time. So if you want to see a derivation of this relation, look at my lecture notes afterwards. Yes? Is this relation valid to all orders in alpha s or only? To all orders in alpha s, that's the magic. <laughs> it's not so super magic. Maybe one thing to discuss is uh, why does this C factor depend on, on mu at all? I mean, it only has these poles, so where is the mu? And the only mu dependence enters because these poles are multiplied by powers of alpha s. And the alpha s depends on mu. So you can rewrite the dd log mu as a derivative with respect to alpha. 
And then you can use the fact that there's only these poles here. And then there's this thing that the d-dimensional beta function has a term to epsilon. Then there's a, a very small amount of <laughs> magic. <laughs> so you have to insert the d-dimensional beta function, and this will drop out. And it's valid to all loop order. In my expansion of what? For Z. If you have if you have alpha x squared corrections, then you get in the no. I mean here I will get corrections. So this 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 relation that the red one is valid to all orders. The right hand side of course that's the one loop result. So this is plus order alpha s squared. This here. This one is not the order in alpha s. It's the order. It's the one over the order in one over epsilon. So if you compute the two-loop diagrams, they will have one over epsilon squared, one over epsilon, and nothing. And it turns out that you don't need well. This one over epsilon squared actually will be given by squares of one loops. You can write more such relations. And the only thing that you really need for the anomalous dimension is the one over epsilon pole. Now this is multiplied by alpha squared. So at the two-loop level, when you take the derivative, you get two alpha. You multiply it by another two alpha, and that will be the anomalous dimension. Good. So now we want to solve this equation. Maybe since I start doing frames, this is a nice equation. So maybe this deserves another frame or so. Um, so we have to solve this, and of course. Maybe what I should have said. So it's convenient to take this logarithmic derivative because things depend on the log. But of course, this is the same as mu d d log mu uh, d d mu. But this equation is roughly the same that you, for example, get in quantum mechanics. If this is sort of the wave function, then d d t of the wave function is the wave function times some matrix Hamiltonian, and you know how to solve this equation. So it's just an exponential. It's a matrix uh, uh, equation, so it's a matrix exponential. And if these don't commute for different mu's, I mean, this also depends on mu, then it will be some mu ordered matrix exponential. But if you really want to solve it, of course, what you do is you diagonalize this matrix. So as soon as you diagonalize the matrix by going to different bases, uh, you can just uh, solve it easily. And it's easy to diagonalize in this case. You saw that we had this nice one to two symmetry. And so what you can do is you can take the sum and the difference of these two Wilson coefficients and that diagonalizes the matrix. So we introduce C plus minus and define this as C1 plus minus C2. And then if you do this, um, the Arch equation becomes diagonal. So it's just gamma plus gamma minus. C plus minus, and the actual result is six plus minus one minus one over number of colors times C plus minus. And we can give this a name, we can call this. It's conventional that one calls the one loop coefficient gamma zero to be confusing. So beta zero is the one loop coefficient. So here, this gamma zero is the one loop coefficient. Um, so now to solve this equation perturbatively, what we do is, of course, so we, we expand this anomalous dimension here, and we use that we can rewrite the d d log mu in terms of alpha s. So if you do d alpha s d log mu, 
that's equal to the eta function, it's equal to minus 2 alpha s, and then alpha s over 4 pi beta 0 plus And so then the equation itself, now if we, if we plug in one loop things, so I have So if it's just a diagonal dd log mu of c is this gamma, then you can solve this by separation of variables. So dc divided by c is equal to d log mu times the gamma plus minus. And then we use this relation here to write this in terms of the beta function. So this is d alpha s over beta of alpha s um, times the gamma plus minus. <coughs> and now we expand everything in alpha. So I expand my anomalous dimension gamma in alpha s and I expand the beta function. And so then this here is d alpha s over, it starts the beta function with a 2 alpha s and the minus and then I get here the gamma 0 times alpha s over 4 pi which cancels the alpha s over 4 pi in the beta function so I get gamma plus minus divided by 2 beta 0 plus order alpha s And then, of course, now I integrate. And so I get a log of c plus minus. I integrate from the scale mw, let's say, down to some scale mu. And here I have. Uh, minus gamma plus minus over 2 beta 0 times the log alpha s of mu divided by alpha s of mw. In principle, I don't have, I want to use this to evolve from the matching scale down. So I wouldn't need necessarily to choose exactly mw. I could also introduce some scale mu h, which would be roughly of order mw. But Let's keep this simple. And so then I can write my coefficient at the low scale is the coefficient at the high scale, at the matching scale, and then times alpha s mu over alpha s mw to the power minus gamma plus minus over 2 eta 0. Sorry, isn't the Ah oh, yes, yes, sorry. Yes, of course. So zero plus minus. Yes, so I do the expansion. Zero plus minus. And then there are of course corrections. So if I had had uh, expanded one order further, there would be an alpha s term here, which would cancel the alpha s here in the denominator, and then you would get an additional constant. So we in principle we could easily go to higher accuracy if we have the two loop anomalous dimension gamma one plus minus. And you see that you get this strange result. I think in Monica's lecture somebody complained about this that it's strange to have this ratio of alpha s's appear with some strange number in the exponent. So the strange number in the exponent is this gamma zero over two beta. And this ratio here comes from solving this evolution equation from the high scale to the low scale. And then, of course, this is the plus minus. So if you now want the C, want the C1, you can 
do the two solutions and then easily get C1 and C2 from this. Just for fun, I evaluated these uh, C1s and C2s at uh, the low scale mu. So if you choose the mu roughly equal to mb, so maybe 4 or 5 GV, then what you find, if I did it correctly, is that C1 after this evolution comes out to be 1.1, and C2 was zero at the tree level, and at the low scale it comes out to minus 0.3. So the coupling is changed as you go to lower energies and you sort of get a 30 percent, well, you get a 0 0.3 instead of 0. If you had done fixed order, you would also get some numbers. I should have maybe computed sort of the fixed order term by just plugging in into the fixed order result. Um, this change is a bit bigger than what you would expect just because there is a log which is, is not huge, but it's also not not zero, and so this is a bit enhanced by this. Good. I would like to add some remarks concerning this, this result. Um, One thing that we can do is, if we want, we can re-expand. So, so this is an expansion in two coupling constants now. We have a coupling constant at this high scale. So this, this result is an expansion in alpha s of mu. It's also an expansion in alpha s of mw. And both are counted of the same order. That's why you then get, can get complicated dependence like this ratio here. So this ratio is an order one quantity in this way of organizing this. If you would compute the one loop corrections, you would explicitly get terms which have an alpha s of mu. And you would also get corrections here, so which have alpha s of mw terms. Um, we can re-expand this entire thing in fixed order, sort of in standard fixed order in a single coupling, by writing that you can use the one loop result for the running coupling if you want and re-expand. So the coupling at the scale mu is this coupling at the scale mw, and then it's divided by 1 plus alpha s mw over 4 pi, and then there's a, some, there's a log and a coefficient with the beta 0. Beta 0 log mu squared over mw squared. So we can see what happens if we take this result and we just plug the alpha s of mu back in here. So if you do this, Then the C plus minus becomes, well, now just plug it in. The numerator cancels, and so you get 1 plus alpha s over 4 pi beta 0. Let me even write 2 beta 0 times log mu over m w. And this is in the denominator, so this gets multiplied by plus gamma 0 plus minus over 2 beta 0. Just plug this in. And then if you expand this, you of course you get a 1. And then at one loop you get an alpha s over 4 pi. Um, the 2 beta cancels here, so it's just a gamma 0 plus minus log mu over mw. So this type of one-loop correction we had in the fixed order matching. But then if you expand further, you'll get 
an exponential, so you also get one half um, this entire thing squared. So one half alpha s over four pi squared, gamma zero plus minus times log squared. So we get an infinite tower of such logarithmic contributions. So what this renormalization group does So there's an alpha s to the n, which always multiplies a log here to the power n mu over nw. And all these logs are resumed. And so these are also called the leading logs. Of course, there are also terms with alpha to the n and one log less. So that would be next to leading log, etc. So this is, these are called leading logs. So, or, so what we do is we have leading log resumation when we do this. And we would have subleading uh, log resumation if we would have continued to higher accuracy. So I'm pacing back and forth nervously because time is running a bit short. So I want to explain what ingredients you need at what order to, to compute here. So we have Wilson coefficients. We will have matrix elements later on. And then we have anomalous dimensions, beta functions. And all of this is needed in, the, in, the country, in this calculation. So if we do leading order here. Um, you see that in this evolution equation when we solved it here, we only took leading order terms and there are corrections of order alpha s. So if you leave the corrections of order alpha s out in this Archie evolution, then we should also consistently leave them out in the matching coefficients. So um, this will be so it will be three level the lowest thing, so we would use c1 is equal 1 and set c2 to 0, even though we know it from our computation. The anomalous dimension, on the other hand, even for the leading log resumation, we needed one loop, anomalous dimensions. And then, of course, the pattern continues. If you want to compute the one loop corrections or the, the alpha s corrections to the evolution, then you will need two loop anomalous dimensions and you will need one loop matrix elements and one loop um, Wilson coefficients. So this is NLO and this continues like this. So the basic message is that you need these anomalous dimensions always one order higher than the Wilson coefficients and matrix elements. Now this involves the resumation of these leading logs, so I can, the leading order is sometimes also called leading log resumation, and the next to leading order is then called next to leading log resumation, etc. Good, so in the minus one minutes that are left, I should do the final thing. Of course, we started and said we wanted to compute this uh, B-quark decay. <laughs> so what we'll have to compute <laughs> So we have our operators now. We know the Wilson coefficients. We evolve them down to a low scale. And now we have to compute these matrix elements where I have my B bar, D 
decaying into uh, d plus pi minus. And of course, I would compute this non-perturbative matrix element for you, but time is up. <laughs> now, I'm <laughs> with less talking, there, there is actually, there's still two scales here. So you can use another effective theory, namely soft collinear effective theory. And it uses the scale hierarchy that the B quark mass is still quite a bit larger than all this non-perturbative QCD that you encounter. So there is still some perturbative physics hidden in between in this. And what actually happens if you do compute this is that you get a factorization theorem you get a B to D form factor evaluated at momentum transfer zero. And then you get a, some complicated thing, some Wilson coefficient-like object called a hard scattering kernel, which depends on some parameter X, which is convoluted with some pion object called a pion distribution amplitude. Now, these here, this form factor is non-perturbative, but you can compute it on the lattice. This, you can make some guess or get it, try to get it from data, like a PDF, and this is perturbative. And so in the minus five minutes, presumably, the reason that what's happening here is if this B quark is very heavy and also the D is very heavy, then the difference between the two is an ex extremely large energy. So then this pion, pion shoots out with a very large energy. In practice, nothing is outrageous here, but still the pion is kind of energetic. And so you produce a quark anti-quark system with very high energy, so there's two quarks close together flying away. And so if you look at this from far away, you don't, it, it's color neutral, so it hardly couples to the rest. So what happens is you get a factorization that there's only very little coupling between the pion which flies out and this B to D transition. And this little coupling is something which you still can compute perturbatively, and then the rest is this object here. Good, sorry for running late. And then on tomorrow, we'll turn to modern effective field series Maybe not quite sketch, but at least set. Okay, that's it for today. Is there, presumably, if you're smart, you can always give a nice <laughs> physical meaning to something. I don't see an immediate uh, reason, maybe Stefan says, why, the, why the, the sum of the two does it. And this diagonal will also only be true at the one loop level, it will break down at two loops. Um, it doesn't matter because these two loop terms are corrections, so once you have the one loop diagonal, you can kind of do perturbation expansion in the two loop matrices and they don't have to be diagonal. It's also not true that you can always diagonalize these matrices. So it's in general, you can only do upper triangular, but it's good enough to, to get a solution. Hmm. Yes? What do you do with diagrams that you can connect the glue of this diagram that you calculated with this factorization? Yes, yeah, so when you, when you prove this, this factorization, so So if you do this quark level transition, so you have B to C, and then there's this spectator D bar which, which goes along, and then there's the two quarks which produce the pion. And of course there are all the diagrams you can think of. For example, you could look at this type of a diagram, and you can show that this is power suppressed in an expansion where the B quark mass goes to infinity. Yes, so the second effective field theory 
The expansion parameter lambda is this lambda QCD, so this 1 GV non perturbative scale divided by MB. If this, uh, if this goes to infinity, then this thing here will be power suppressed. It's also, it's a bit, it's even not entirely true. So you, what one does is what Sebastian explained to you yesterday. So you introduce all these fields and modes. Then you can do a decoupling transformation and show that this will not contribute. So it might not even be true that a single diagram is good enough. But if you compute this plus the other one, so this plus this will uh, separately, the green and the red diagram will give you a power suppressed contribution. But this is not a simple analysis, so this needs a lot of horsepower, so you have to set up this effective field theory with the soft and collinear modes. You've seen this yesterday, it's not simple, and then you have to derive, you analyze the process, you do these redefinitions, and you, you can show that this factorizes. This is one of the first things that were proven in this soft collinear effective theory. So there's a paper by Bauer, Stewart, Periol, and I'm forgetting maybe somebody which does this. I think I have the reference. I have some nice pictures. So the lecture now continues for a few slides. Um, and there are the references which show this, except that they will not be easily readable because you need this formalism here, which we'll discuss a little bit or we move towards this direction tomorrow. Or you go to Sebastian and he will derive it for you. <laughs>